Okay, in a lot of ways, this is the hardest day of the semester in this class. And as we go through this, I want you to uh, just know that what we're gonna be covering is challenging, but there's not so much of it. So as we go through this video and you're 30 minutes of the way in and you're getting overwhelmed, just know if we're 30 minutes through this video, we've pretty much learned everything. And from that point on, it will just be about trying to conceptualize these ideas and convert them into our long-term memory so that we can use this to incorporate lots of our other skills into one big personal finance picture. And if you look at the uh, semester layout for this class, you'll see that tomorrow is it, it, kind of a review day. It's connecting a lot of pieces. So we're gonna be taking what we're learning today and sort of tossing everything back in uh, to, to uh, incorporate what we're doing today. So definitely take really good notes as we go through this. If you can learn to follow these rules that we have set up, it won't be so tough. Okay, so everything you've really learned about income taxes for the U.S. so far has been a complete simplification of how things work. Accountants get paid big money, and uh, one reason is they have to know a ton of rules. And what we're going to try to do in this video is go over some of the rules that you need to know, uh, not necessarily to file your own taxes per se, but more to make your own plans. For example, you might be thinking, should you add more contribution to your 401k? Well, you would like to know what your tax situation is before you make that decision. And if you don't know how to figure out what your taxes are, there's really no way to make an educated choice. All right, so here's what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna start with a person's income, and then we're gonna go through all the steps in regards to taxes. Those tax brackets we've been talking about in the past still apply. But what people pay on their taxes, you'll see, is a lot less than what we've suggested up to this point. Okay, so going through the steps here. I'm going to go ahead and write some steps over here so that we keep this in mind. The first step that we're always going to start with is your total income. Okay, total income, nothing fancy here. This is your income that you have uh, from your job and perhaps from other sources. So starting with total income, this includes the following. Basically any income that is subject to U.S. taxes. All right, I put that up there because you already have a pretty good idea of what should be included in U.S. taxes. But just to make sure that we don't forget this, um, you know, the, the things that are included here are things like your regular income, right? So that would be your income from your job, um, some investment income, right? We've talked about this in the past, how things get taxed. If you have uh, stocks that are not in any sort of vehicle, you just bought them in a taxable account. Well, you're going to pay income taxes on stocks if they're held for less than a year, and then you're going to pay income on dividends if you've had them less than, what, six months, ordinary dividends. Um, so you've got to remember that, okay? Uh, rental income does count, and et cetera, okay? Making note of this now, not because it's new material, but we've been talking about Social Security some, and what is taxable for Social Security is different from what's taxable for U.S. federal income, okay? Uh, so we, we do have to try to keep those things in mind. So let's say for the person that we discuss here, somebody named Joe, let's say that they have a total income. Let's write it over here. Let's say that Joe has uh, $180,000 in total income. All right, that'd be income from all of his various earning sources that are treated like total income. Okay? What we've done in the past is basically just you know, withdraw things like 401ks and then we were done with it, you're going to see there's a lot of extra steps. But nonetheless, the very next step in this process is going to be and moving to the next step. As we move to the next step, what we need to do is deduct things that are never even considered taxable, okay? You can kind of think about 
different assets is being compartmentalized in different ways. So for example, in regards to taxes, think about how a traditional 401k is handled versus a traditional IRA. Traditional 401k, your employer is just never going to pay you that money. The money is never going to be realized as income. So essentially, it's going to be taken out immediately from total income. All right. Whereas with a traditional IRA, you get the income first, you then put money into an IRA, so it's like you realize the income and then kind of unrealized that income. So moving to the next step is to take out the things that never really were like income at all. All right, so a list of things. Uh, traditional 401k, 457b, 403b, right? Traditional versions of all of those. Uh, what else? What else should be considered? HSAs, right? FSAs. We talked about three different types of FSAs you could use. Dependent care, medical, uh, limited use, right? Um, health insurance premiums. Pensions. This is all stuff that we've been talking about. Okay. Money that you put into a pension, contribution to a pension, uh, also satisfy this. And I'm just going to say others. There are other things that might count here as well that we haven't discussed so much in this class. All of this stuff is really quite complicated if you want to be an expert at it. And that's why accountants get paid so much money. They have to know so much, okay? We're not trying to be accountants in this class. We're just trying to manage our personal finance situation. So these are the common things that you might be contributing to, but there are other things that might fall into this category. So remember, as we go from total income to the next step, the stuff that gets removed is all of these components here, all right? So your next step after total income is your gross income. We have not used this terminology. I didn't even try. I didn't even try to use the correct terminology because I thought it was sort of pointless early on in this class, but now we've got to use the terminology correctly. So gross income, from now on, recognize it means something different from total income, okay? Gross income is your total income minus all that stuff that is never really treated as income at all, right? A lot of times those elective things that you do, like contribute to an HSA, those things will be taken out and you'll be left with gross income, okay? So for our friend Joe over here, maybe he puts $18,000 into a 401k, a traditional 401k, all right? He starts with $180,000, he puts $18,000 into a traditional 401k, then that would leave him with $162,000. Right? We're ultimately trying to figure out how much taxes Joe is going to pay, so we're going to move through these steps one by one, and you have to go in correct order or you'll have problems. All right. So, so far, no big deal. Things we've already done. You go from your total income, take out the stuff that you've decided will not be in income tax ever, definitely not, Right. stuff that you never see as real income to you, and that leaves you with the gross income. Easy enough. All right, moving to the next step. This is where stuff starts to get tricky. All right, moving to the next step. The next step I'm gonna go ahead and tell you is gonna be called your adjusted gross income, or AGI. If you start looking into personal finance, it's a hobby of yours, a passion of yours, you know, something you really care about, start reading message boards and stuff, there's gonna be a lot of discussion on adjusted gross income. Really important that you understand what this means. All right, so moving to the next step, to go from gross income to adjusted gross income, there's a big category of deductions that we have to take care of, okay? So to move to the next step, we need to subtract all above the line deductions.
subtract all the above the line deductions, okay? Above the line deductions are determined by the federal government. Above the line just refers to where it is on your tax form, all right? There's some deductions that are above a line, and there are some deductions that are below the line. And that's all people refer to them as now, above the line or below the line deductions, okay? These above the line deductions you'll see are really useful because they always get deducted, which is not true of the different types of deductions we'll see here in just a bit, okay? So these are things that are definitely going to be deducted. All of these things will reduce your taxable income, okay? So everything you see here will definitely reduce your taxable income. So this is like the best type of deductions to have because it will definitely play a role, okay? So the things that are included here, there are lots and lots of things that are included here. I'm going to give you some of the most important examples. Some of these are gonna be completely unimportant to you personally. Some will be very important to you personally. Here's one that I didn't know would be a big deal to me, but turns out it has been. Some select business expenses. For example, a very common one here is, let's imagine that you take out a mortgage on a house and then you turn it into a rental property. Well, it turns out that you can receive basically a write-off or a tax deduction on the interest you're paying on that mortgage. Let me say that again. You take out a mortgage on a $200,000 house and then you rent it out, you can deduct the interest you're paying on that mortgage as an above the line deduction, okay? There's other things that are included here. You got a little small business, there's all kinds of things you might potentially be able to write off. Uh, you cut grass, you might be able to write off your lawnmower potentially, okay? So there's lots of things that could go in here. Um, and this is generally for like side businesses and such that you have. If you're, a, uh, if you're running your own business, this is a big deal, the things you put here, right? So some select business expenses. This gets very specific. I'm not going to go any further than that. SHA contributions when you use a private insurer. All right, everything we've talked about so far, we've really thought that you know HSAs are tied to your health insurance that is offered by your employer. It's not always the case. What if you are privately employed? What if you run your own business and you wanna to contribute to an HSA? You can, okay? You can, but the problem is it will not be taken out of your taxable income, okay? Meaning you will realize the money and then contribute to an HSA. So it needs to not be taxed. This is where it falls in, okay? Now you might be wondering, why care? Why, why spend so much time going through each of these specific things? Well, here's the deal. Some stuff is based on gross income and some is based on adjusted gross income. These things will have different ramifications depending on what you're talking about. We'll see some examples of that later today. So you need to actually compare these two and know what they are for you, at least have a decent estimate, okay? So whether your HSA goes here or here, whether it goes as is taken out here between steps one and two, or whether your HSA contribution is taken out here between steps two and three might actually matter for some things, okay? Even though they're not going to uh, be taxed as income, those contributions, they may have ramifications on other aspects of your personal finance plan. I said it was gonna get complicated. Here it's getting complicated. A third one here, traditional retirement contributions that aren't already removed, okay? So traditional 401ks, that will have already been taken out before you get to step two because that money would have never appeared to you, but traditional IRAs have not. So this is where the traditional IRA would play in. Right, so it would be an above the line deduction, meaning right here is where it would get deducted. Uh, but I'm just gonna give you two more. These are probably the two you should care about the most. The fourth one here is
student loan interest up to $2,500 in student loan interest that you pay. Let me be very clear here. This is student loan interest that you pay, not student loan debt, okay? For example, if you pay $10,000 in repayments for your loan, perhaps $2,000 of it goes to interest and $8,000 of it goes to principal, all right? The principal here refers to the amount that you're paying down. You're, you're 50 grand in debt, it goes down by $8,000 because of your payments. But some of your payments just go to canceling out interest on your debt. This part right here is what can be an above the line deduction, all right? So if you have student loan debt, what this tells you is student loan debt is not such a bad debt to have because it provides an above the line deduction. All right, big ramifications here. Let's say that you've got a student loan with 8% interest. At the same time, you have a car loan at 8% interest. Which one should you pay off faster? Usually the car loan. Typically, you're better off keeping the student loan debt because when you do make payments on the student loan debt, you get a deduction on the interest. This is where we kind of move to advanced topics in personal finance. If you're trying to save yourself a lot of money, some debt is not so bad, some debt is terrible. Because student loan debt is an above the line deduction, it makes sense that that would be a debt that you wouldn't so much be upset to have, okay? Furthermore, you'd want to be strategic, all right? You would, you would try, if possible, try not to exceed $2,500 in interest payments if feasible for your student loan debt, okay? So this is gonna make your student loan debt not quite as bad as it otherwise could be. And furthermore, tuition and fees for you, your dependents, spouse, that also is an above the line deduction. Um, I, I think there is some sort of maximum on how high we can go with this. Um, but if, if you're like getting paid 50 grand a year and also paying $10,000 in tuition, that $10,000 will be a big above the line deduction, okay? So what that means is going to college is cheaper than you might otherwise think. Paying for your kid's education when you're older, not as expensive as you think because you might be paying 60 grand for tuition for two kids, but you're seeing a $60,000 reduction in your taxable income at the same time, okay? Definitely something that you're gonna care about in the future if you don't care about it now. All right, so this is just some. There is a huge list of above the line deductions, but this is some that are the most important um, in regards to testing you guys on it. These are the ones that I might get in specifics on. I'm not gonna worry about any other ones up here. All right? I'm gonna try to keep things relatively simple here. All right, so I might ask you on the quiz, student loan debt, explain how it works in regards to uh, deductions. And you would tell me that it's an above the line deduction. Explain what that means, okay? Otherwise, on the exam, I'll just say, Joe has, I don't know, $10,000 in above the line deductions. And you would just need to apply it correctly. So for our friend Joe over here, if he has $10,000 in above the line deductions, you know, maybe he uh, has some business expenses, maybe he contributed to a traditional IRA, Add all that stuff up, his income now has been driven down to the AGI, adjusted gross income, of $152,000. All right, let's make sure we know where we're at. We started with how much money he had in total. That's all of his income. We took out the stuff that he never really sees as income, like traditional 401k and typically HSA contributions. Then we take out the stuff that are, are categorized as above the line deductions. It's a mix, mix match of stuff here, right? Uh, it's a hodgepodge of, of different things that are just termed as above the line deductions. Stuff that the government has just decided you should not have to pay taxes on, okay? So he makes $10,000 in traditional IRA contributions. Maybe he's got some student loan debt that he's paying back and that drives him down to $152,000, all right? Remember, we're trying to figure out their federal income taxes here. And so we're whittling away at the information uh, that's necessary to consider. All right, so that takes us to AGI. After we take all that out, we're left with Joe's 152,000. We are at step three, the AGI. 
adjusted gross income. Okay, so AGI, adjusted gross income. This is number three. Is your gross income, GI, minus above the line deductions. Okay? So you can kind of see each, each of these numbers that I'm giving over here, there's a certain value associated with them. And we're explaining what happens in between those steps. Okay? So what we just discussed is the stuff that happens between two and three. Now we're going to think about what happens between three and four. And I'll go on and let you know here that the fourth one is taxable income. Okay? So as we move from three to four, we're getting into the taxable income. The last step, um, there's a lot to learn there, right, with above the line deductions, but it's not especially complicated. You're just taking out stuff that the government has decided are above the line deductions. Here's where we have a really complicated step. Okay, this is the most important step in taxes. All right, right here, what happens next? As you go from AGI, you're going to be moving towards your taxable income. Here you have two choices. You can take what's called the standard deduction, or you can take below-the-line deductions, or sometimes called itemizable deductions. All right, this is the two options that you're going to have. The choice will depend on your specific amount of things that would be categorized as itemized deductions. If you've heard of these standard deductions and itemized deductions, part of the reason you might have heard of this is just a few years back, they greatly increased the standard deduction and it was big news for a while. Um, so this is something that has been in the news recently, so you may have heard of a little bit more than normal. Um, Ask your parents, ask, ask friends that, that have jobs, ask them about standard versus itemized deductions. They probably won't know much, which is amazing considering what a huge deal this is, okay? The standard deduction, all right, what the standard deduction essentially is, is a guaranteed reduction in taxable income, all right? And we'll get to how this specifically is, is calculated here in a bit, but I think it'll be easier if we first talk about these itemized deductions. And this is where you go by case by case, add up all the potential deductions. add up all of the potential below the line deductions, okay? So above the line deductions, we're done with those. Those have already been applied. If you have above the line deductions, they're always gonna reduce your taxable income. But what you're gonna see here is, these will only reduce your income if it's in your best interest to do so. So the things that we're gonna list out for itemizable deductions are often not as valuable because you may not be itemizing. If you choose to take this standard deduction, you'll see that basically all this stuff becomes irrelevant. Okay? So let's go through a list of itemized deductions. If you're getting confused, that's all right. All right? It's, it's going to be confusing the first time through it. We're going to try to go through some examples to make sure that we understand what's going on here. This is certainly one of those situations where you want to be repetitive. We're going to go back through these things over and over again. Okay? So let me give you a list of itemizable deductions. These are the itemizable deductions. Again, categorize this separately in your mind from the above the line deductions. Those are gone. These are now the below the line or itemizable deductions. Okay, these are things you have the option to deduct. So let me give you a list. Charitable donations. Could be a big deal. Could be zero dollars depending on who you are. If you make substantial donations to your church, for example, You'll have a lot of charitable donations. I run a lot of like 5Ks and half marathons and stuff, and those are almost always donations to charity. Uh, and there ends up being a lot there for me, just you know, thousand dollars a year in some cases. Um, so for me, this is going to be a big deal for me if I choose to itemize. And the more of these things that I have, the more potential deductions I have, so the more likely I am to itemize. Okay. 
Uh, here's another big one. Mortgage interest. On a non-rental property. What I mean by this is mortgage interest on a property that you're not trying to make a profit off of. So the house you live in counts here. That beach house you have that you go visit every, you know, every few weeks, as long as you don't rent it out to anybody else, it counts. Okay? This can be a big deal because if you have a five hundred thousand dollar house in Atlanta, you know, you might be paying fifteen thousand dollars a year in interest, just in interest. Okay? So this could be a big deal. Remember, keep in mind this is interest. We haven't gotten to the the, rent, the real estate chapter yet. We'll make sure we explain this better when we get to that part. Um, but in regards to interest here, this is how much you're paying just essentially in fees to the lender. You're not paying down the principal. You're not paying how, down how much you owe. You're just canceling out the interest that they're charging you. Okay. Some investment expenses. If you hire a financial planner, that counts, okay? Uh, some things count, some things don't. Expense ratios don't, all right? But this essentially what this means is if you're going to itemize, hiring a financial planner is cheaper because if you're gonna itemize, that financial pl planner now becomes a write-off for you, okay? Medical expenses. If they are more than 7.5% of your AGI. Wow, I can't make it complicated, any simpler. <laughs> I mean, this is as complicated as you could possibly make something. So you have to know how to solve for your AGI for this to work. This is always funny to me when, when something references itself, all right? Your AGI that you can solve for, all right, you'll then reduce from that. And if you are have significant medical expenses, you can figure out how much can be deducted if you've already solved for your AGI. What a mess, what an absolute mess. Don't worry, I'm not gonna make it that tough on the exam. But if you have some big medical expense, yeah, that'll work, that'll help. Here's a big one, state income taxes. Boy, we've not made reference to this before. You can actually deduct your state income taxes. We did not talk about this in the past because it complicates things so dramatically. What this means is you have to solve for your state income taxes before you solve for your federal income taxes. What's weird is though, solving for your state income taxes requires that you solve for your federal first. What the hell? It is a huge mess. We're gonna to try to keep things simple, just stuff that you need to know, okay? So, property taxes, it's good to know. That's an itemizable deduction. And I'm just gonna say down here, many, many others. There are so many things on this list. When people talk about rich people figuring out ways to avoid taxes, this is often what they're talking about with all these itemizations. There are so many things that are potentially itemizable, okay? What I want you to know, um, essentially, is I'm not gonna ask you to memorize any of that, okay? What I want you to be able to do is figure out what to do once you have calculated your itemizable deductions, all right? So you add all this up, all the things you could possibly have, you add all that up, and you'll have some sort of amount, okay? Maybe $10,000. What that amount is will make you determine if it's going to be a good idea to take the itemizable deduction or the standardized deduction. Hope I haven't lost you yet. Okay, if I have, rewind back, start it over. Okay, so the standard deduction now. Let's make sure we understand this. Again, you got two options. You can itemize, you can go through all those things and add them all up. Or you can take the standard deduction, which just says, I'm gonna get a guaranteed deduction, regardless of what I'm doing, okay? Regardless of all that stuff we just talked about. So here are the standard deductions. If you are single, it's $12,400. So essentially your income, if you're watching this video right now, your income taxes are gonna be a lot lower than you perhaps expected. Because for, for you, they're going to take out at least $12,400 in deductions for everyone. Now, why do they do this? Okay, the, the simple answer is this. Everybody has stuff they could itemize. But if everyone's itemizing, what a huge waste of resources. What a huge waste of time for me to, to get my $300 in charitable donations, add them all up, get the receipts, turn it in, and then the IRS has to potentially sort through all this information. What a mess. 
So here's what the government decided. To eliminate so many people from taking itemized deductions, let's just give them the option of taking a standard deduction of 12,400. That way, lots of people will just take the standard deduction. They don't have to worry about their itemized deduction. They don't have to add up their charitable expenses and, and all that other stuff we just talked about. They don't have to worry about that, okay? That's the logic. So your income tax burden is gonna be lower than you might've expected because everyone gets at least the standard deduction. So if you're single, you get $12,400 taken off your income or more if you choose to itemize. And the only time you would choose to itemize is if it's more than $12,400, okay? If you're married, double it. It moves to $24,800, okay? So let's think about Joe. Joe adds up all of those potential itemiz itemizations. He's got $3,000 in mortgage interest, $1,000 in charitable donations. Um, he's got $6,000 in state income taxes. He adds all that up and he finds that he has potential itemizations of $10,000. Joe is single, okay? So he's got two options here he's got to decide which one to take. You can see that everything we just talked about, all those complex things, they all boil down to really a simple choice. Which would lower your taxes more? The standard deduction of $12,400 or the potential itemizations of $10,000? Which would be better? Well, this is showing how much you're going to reduce your income taxes by. So, Joe is going to opt for the standard deduction, okay? So what that means is Joe's income standing now as we get to taxable income is going to go down by $12,400. And so this is where he's left now. So again, that's the standard deduction. There's some very important ramifications of what we just discussed. We're going to get to that in the next video. There's a lot to unpack there, a lot of important information. All right? So, we've got to taxable income now. Taxable income, step number four. We've gotten through all the hard stuff, which is good. Taxable income is your AGI minus your standard or itemized deductions. depending on which one is larger, all right? So for Joe, that takes him now to 139.6. All right, step four is easy, okay? The only thing we need to do now is solve for taxes, okay? So solve for taxes. So the next thing we do here is solve for taxes. So we can run this through the ringer and figure out what Joe's taxes would be. I'm gonna pause the video, I'm gonna do that right now. Okay, so picking back up here with Joe, I just went in and solved for his taxes. Did this using the brackets that we are very accustomed to using at this point. So once you get to the brackets, you solve in the same fashion that we had before. It's just we're using now the correct answer. All right, so you might think we're done. There's our taxes. We're still not done. We are still not done. So what we've essentially solved here for step five is your taxes without credits, your taxes without credits. So for Joe, switching now from thinking about income to now thinking about taxes, we now see that he has federal income taxes of 27,583.50, okay? We got just one step left, okay? Again, if you're getting overwhelmed, it's the same steps over and over, all right? So it's really annoying and complicated the first couple times. Once you practice it, it's really not that hard because it's just the same stuff over and over again, okay? So for Joe, the last step we're going to have to take, we've got his taxable income. We use that to figure out the taxes without credits. So 
Taxes without credits here, step five. Is the, the penultimate step. There's only one thing we need to do, and that is apply tax credits. A tax credit is a special type of deduction. They're not super common, but they're very important when they're available. I get two huge tax credits every single year because I have two kids. Massive tax credits. A tax credit reduces your taxes, not your taxable income. Think about that. It reduces your taxes, not your taxable income. So what that means is, which would you rather have? An above the line deduction, for example, or a tax credit? We definitely prefer to have a tax credit, okay? Reducing your income by $1,000 helps a little, but reducing your taxes by $1,000 is just $1,000 in your pocket, okay? So a tax credit reduces your taxes. That's why we had to first solve for your taxes, right? You solve for your taxes without the credits, then you can apply your tax credits. I'm gonna give you a couple of really important examples of tax credits. The most important one is the child tax credit. $2,000 per child. Boom, $2,000 per child. I have two kids, my taxes is $4,000 less because I have two kids. Kids can significantly reduce your tax burden. That's not the only place. There's also some, some uh, potential tax credits for daycare. Um, there's huge tax credits if you adopt a child. If that child has special needs, the tax credits are even bigger. So this could be a really big deal to you. But for most people, you have just, you know, you have kids, you don't adopt your kids, you have kids a traditional route. $2,000 per kid, tax credit, up to as many kids as you have. If you got 10, 20 grand in reduced taxes. That means a lot of people are gonna pay zero taxes. And some people are gonna pay negative taxes. The rules get very complicated, but if your tax credits are large enough for child tax credits, it can actually push your taxes negative. And so the government sends you a check just for existing. Wow, all right, now you can see why we got such budget crisis in the US. People aren't paying much taxes. All right, so this is gonna reduce your child, your, your, each child's gonna reduce your overall taxes by $2,000. Um, that's obviously a very important one. Um, let me give you just one more here, and this one's one that you might care about a lot. It's called like a saver's tax credit. This is up to 50% tax credit for each dollar you contribute to a retirement vehicle. Say, what? That sounds good. Right? Think about what this means. If you put money in a 401k, you're already avoiding taxes. But now the government's going to give you 50 cents on the dollar on top of that. Right? So you put $1,000 into your 401k, your taxable income goes down by 1000 and then the government gives you perhaps $500 in a check, basically reducing your taxes by $500 on top of that. This is an amazing deal. This does get complicated, all right? The eligibility is based on your income. So to receive the 50%, it's based on your AGI. Let's see if I've got the figure here, I think I do. Well, this has very specific rules. AGI is less than $19,250. Again, I, I gotta make everything so complicated, right? So if your AGI is less than $19,250, you'll be eligible to this savers tax credit. I like showing you this for two reasons. One, your first job Maybe you, maybe you start working in August. If you start working in August, you probably will make less than $19,250 that year. 
So when you put a dollar into your traditional 401k, not only will that reduce your taxable income, the government's also gonna give you 50 cents on top of that. Why do they do that? Well, part of the reason is, actually think about it. If your income is this low, you're not paying any taxes anyway, so you don't have as much of an incentive to put money in. So the government's gonna give you a credit instead. All right, so they're gonna give you a credit to make that purchase. Um, the benefits phase out as your incomes go up. I'm not gonna go into specifics, but it's like between 19,250 and 40,000, they'll give you 30% back or something like that. So if this is, if you wanna reduce your taxable income, this is something that we could talk more about in this class if you wanted to, um, but it's something you can figure out on your own pretty easily as well. As long as you can calculate your AGI, you can figure this out, okay? One neat thing to, to note about this is you're in control of your AGI. So if your AGI is 20,000, you could put $1,000 extra in your 401k and your AGI would actually go down by $1,000. It gets pretty complicated when you start thinking about it all because you control your AGI based on your contributions and then your tax burden is based on your AGI, which you control. So it's really a very, very much a self-guided mission. If your AGI is too high, there are ways to fix that. There are ways to drive it down, more in the HSA, more in the 401k, more in the traditional IRA, et cetera, okay? All right, so let's get back to Joe and let's keep things very simple. In regards to the exam, I think I'm just gonna stick with the child tax credit. That's the only one I'm going to require you to know. So let's say for Joe, let's say he has uh, just one kid, okay? Single parent, all right? Depending on who has custody, we'll determine who gets the child tax credit. Let's say that Joe has custody of just one child. Well, what that will do is, is it will reduce his taxes by $2,000, okay? So step six is your taxes, all right? This is how much you're actually going to pay in federal income taxes once everything is considered. So for Joe here, all we got to do is take out the $2,000 and we have finally, finally figured out how much taxes he's going to pay. Can you see why I didn't teach this when we first started this class? It would have been overwhelming, right? I'm trying to teach you how to do your taxes and then I'm like, well, HSAs reduce your taxable income. Then I have to explain what that is. What a huge mess, right? So I have to put this near the end of class because there's just no way to talk about this early on. I have to teach it to you wrong the first time just to make it manageable to understand this, combining all the elements really that we have in this class into just one lesson here, okay? Very complicated the first time you see it. Very, very complicated because so much is going on. But I'm gonna give you guys some practice problems in the next video that we're gonna work through together. I'm gonna give you a whole slew of practice problems on the worksheet. I'm telling you guys, if you practice it, this won't be that hard. It will not be one of the hardest things we do all year once you practice it, because it is incredibly repetitive. It's the same rules over and over again. All you have to do is apply rules. All of y'all know how to apply rules. All of you know how to multiply, subtract, and add. That's all it is. You just have to combine these principles together.